first of all, I'd like to thank the NGMA for hosting this event, and um, also SG Vasudev for uh, giving me this opportunity to have this conversation with them. I must also thank Amu Joseph, a fellow journalist, and uh, Vasudev's wife for uh, reconnecting me with Vasudev, whom I had last interviewed when I was working for the Times of India group. I was the editor of Vantage, the magazine of its, the short-lived publication of Times of India, which was the Independent. And I had interviewed Vasudev then in Bombay. I'm not sure whether he remembers it in 1990. So this is my second uh, encounter with him, so to speak. Uh, the, I'm sure many of you have already uh, sort of had a look at the retrospective. It's a phenomenal display of um, Vasudev's work spanning over five decades. And um, what makes it amazing is that it is not just the, you know, the life's work of an ivory tower artist. It's, um, it's, Vasudev represents a movement, what was called the Madras art movement. And this had a very big role to play in shaping the artistic, the sensibility of um, Indian uh, art in those times. And especially South Indian artists, um, you know, they broke away from the uh, influence of uh, Western art traditions, contemporary art traditions of modernism. I mean, it seems like an oxymoron to say tradition and modernism together, but uh, you know, the modern art movement in the West had uh, almost ossified into a tradition. And uh, we saw the progressive artists uh, group, uh, the PAG, uh, pioneered by Hussein, Souza, and all of them, which did some amazing work to put India on the world map in terms of contemporary art. But in the South, a very different kind of disruptive movement was taking place in art. And that was uh, the movement which uh, Vasudev was very much involved with and was uh, one of the pioneers of. And this was a movement to not reject modernism, to ac accept modernism, but root it in an Indian sensibility. And I think this was very, very important because uh, it, you know, it came at a stage uh, in the 60s when he actually began his uh, life's work in, uh, as an artist. Um, it was important because South India, as many of the panel discussions earlier in the month have shown, uh, was, uh, you know, almost invisible in the Indian art scene. So it was very important for this uh, sensibility to take shape and to survive despite being ignored by, practically ignored by the rest of India. So I think it was a very courageous uh, endeavor on the part of South Indian artists and hats off to people like Vasudev for continuing to plow the lonely furrow, to, so to speak. And um, I thought, I mean, so much has been said already, the retrospect itself and the, uh, you know, the film on Vasudev which was screened here and uh, you know there was a discussion following that which I couldn't attend, but I'm sure a lot of the uh, events, the uh, which have uh, the ancillary events linked to the retrospective, have gone through so many aspects of Vasudev's work. But I just thought uh, you know today I would go a little deeper and hear it, uh, hear some of Vasudev's own views because so far he has been somewhat silent spectator in this whole program, the month-long program that we've seen. So, you know, we're almost near the end of it. So I thought it'd be nice to hear from him uh, some of his thoughts on, you know, his life's journey and where he is today. And, uh, you know, taking off from the title of the exhibition, which has been so beautifully curated by Sadan Menon and equally well-designed uh, by um, Miti Desai, um, I, I think I will, you know, take a cue from the fact that, um, you know, the title says um, Inner Resonance Back to Sama. Now, Sama is a new be beginning, so to speak, an old beginning and a new beginning. So perhaps we can go back to uh, Vasudev's childhood, which was the beginning of which was where this whole story began. So Vasudev, um, 
just wanted to check, the, you know, wanted you to speak a little, delve a little deep into your memories of your early childhood, which shaped your aesthetic sensibility. And what were, uh, what are the things you remember most about uh, your love for art? How did it all begin? Thank you, Prima. Thanks to all of you who have come here today. Um, yeah, I was, uh, I was born in Mysore. My mother is from Mysore and uh, my father is from Bangalore. But uh, all our childhood days, you know, we would go to Mysore most of the time and spend our holidays there. And my grandfather, my mother's father, he was working for uh, Chamundi, Chamundeshwari Temple in Mysore for 40 years. And so the connection with the temple, Chamundi Hills, Mysore, were very important for me. And uh, my mother, uh, she got uh, some uh, gold medal award, gold medal for her drawing in Dasara exhibition those days, I think in the 30s. You know, and, uh, but unfortunately, you know, she didn't, uh, the, her parents didn't allow her to join an art school or whatever it is at that time, you know, very difficult. Anyway, that was my uh, background. And uh, even now, you know, the connection of, uh, many people ask me, uh, why elephant recurs in my work? And uh, because I, I, I used to like the elephants in Mysore so much, you know, that particularly the, the house of my grandfather in Mysore, we were very close by the, you know, the palace and all the elephants in the palace were all in a herd and they were all together. And so we used to go there and see those things. And uh, Chamundi Hills is another one you know, up and down a uh, thousand steps. My, father, my grandfather used to go up in the morning and come back in the evening sometimes. So with the stories and other things he was telling and you know, everything really had a uh, sort of a, an impact on me. My mother, uh, you know, my, my mother's grandfather, that is my mother's, mother, mother's mother's father, he was an Ayurvedic doctor and, um, for Paris. And uh, I believe he also used to paint and sculpt, you know, and of course very traditional way. And uh, he, he used to create the entire palace, procession, everything in Dasara time, cutting, painting on the cardboard, cutting it and putting them all together. And uh, so his house was very close to the palace. And so people would go to the palace and go to the house to see that work of his. And my mother, I believe, used to be a volunteer at that time. She was about eight or 10 or whatever it is. And so it, 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 she absorbed that sort of a quality of her, of her grandfather. And then she started doing similar things when we were young. You know, in the world, Dasara times, every day, Every second day, third day, she would do something else. I mean, Boman Hadikindri Jogi or many stories or uh, palace itself, she would create a uh, painted palace and things like that. So, these are all the early impacts on me. But at no, no point of time, I thought I would become an artist. You know, and um, so, like anybody else, I have to study other subjects. And uh, so, when I I, I then uh, I, I grew up in Bangalore mostly, and um, then I used to like uh, any of my cousins going to school, to school, college, and things like that. It's only it's only when I was uh, in uh, when I was about uh, um, 14, 15, I started taking interest in cartooning, caricatures, and that was the uh, then I it so happened that. Um, uh, Laurel and Hardy, you know, one of the, the two two famous comedians, and Hardy died, and so I did a caricature of Hardy, and then sent it to one very famous paper at that time, Thai Nadu, Kannada paper. It got published on Sunday, so I was very excited about it. Then I went and met the uh, editor, and editor said, "You can continue to do something whenever you want to do some drawings, caricatures. You can send it." That's how I started. A caricature series. Then, of course, it, uh, uh, the other newspapers, like Sanjeev Karnataka, Pradhanata, they also asked me to do certain things. But I never, uh, even at that point of time, I, I didn't know that I was going to become a cartoonist or an artist. But then, uh, anyway, because you see, I don't know. I mean, even at home, uh, my parents expected me to become a 
either a doctor or an engineer or a lawyer or something, because all of my cousins, all my cousins are that, you know. So they wanted me to become that. But uh, never had, uh, I never thought about it. Um, but my, my influence of uh, car, car, uh, caricatures is mainly from David Lowe and R.K. Lakshmi. These are the two uh, people who inspired me to do those cartoons. Then it so happened that um, uh, and I was always a 40-45% person you know, in the class, never, never more than that. And, uh, and I was in the National College, we were studied in the National High School National College, and where they really looked down upon the people who are under 60 marks. And uh, so I was one of those persons. And even, you know, I'll tell you an incident when uh, I did a caricature of the professor, the principal, and um, he was a character for caricature, if you look at it. So in the classroom I did that, and they set it for an annual uh, magazine thing, you know. So then I was hard, he called me in the office, and he said, you need my yell madri, he tried to the classroom in sir. However, you were not listening to my lecture. I said, sir, my friend was taking notes, dictation, so I thought I could take it from him and take it. I thought it was interesting to do your work. Now I will not allow this to be appear in the magazine. That was the sort of a thing that National College did to me. And they never encouraged art. They encouraged theater, they encouraged music, dance, but never art. And uh, so that was my complaint always. You know, uh, My complaint about the college is that, anyway, so it was, um, some, then you know, I finished my intermediate. Intermediate is another before the university started intermediate was a course. So I finished my intermediate, and my father said, well, "At least you can join agriculture college in Nepal because he himself studied agriculture. He was an agriculturist, and so he took me to Nepal college. And uh, the principal saw my marks. He said, "No chance, no chance. He need not." Uh, then my father said, look, I want him to study agriculture only because he can help me not to take any, anybody else's job. Then no, sir, it's impossible. You know, he, he cannot get in here. So then some people advised my parents that it's better to go to uh, you know, BSc, Physics, Chemistry, and Mathematics in National College itself. National College couldn't reject a student because uh, they had to give to give permission. They, give, they had to accept. Uh, whatever level student was in the college. So I was admitted again there. And I had uh, tuition for all the subjects, Greek, with mathematics, and uh, that was really a torture. Every day tuition, people were coming, te teaching me things. And I was really, you know, I didn't know what to do. But anyway, cartooning was one thing which I went on doing. And it so happened, I happened to meet one Jeeva Gattachan. Vakatachalam was one of the first generation artist, art critic in India. And uh, he used to come to Bangalore quite often. And uh, he's a theosophist, he's a theosophist, and he used to come and stay here. And I, I was introduced to him by one of my cousins. And he saw some of my line drawings and things like that, and he said, you must join an art school. Uh, there's no way you can, you should go to an art school. And I, I told him, sir, it's very difficult for me to convince my parents about it. And uh, he said, you would talk to them. Anyway, he was one of the persons who really uh, you know, helped me. And then he said, this institution at that time was Chennai. It's very far, not too far from here. And Panikkar is a very good teacher. And so he should join the arts. So that's how I left Bangalore in 1960 to join the arts. Fascinating story. <laughs> So I guess your um, love for storytelling and uh, for drawing actually came from your family, your uh, yeah. the influence of your family, and by inspired also by cartoonists. Yeah. But uh, after that, when you went to Madras uh, School of Art, um, you came across uh, you know very uh, important artists of that time, like um, David Prasad. Um, uh, Roy Chaudhary from uh, uh, the Bengal, from Bengal, and also KCS Manikar, who was to prove a big influence in your uh, artistic uh, development, right? right? 
तो देवी प्रसाद राय चौधरी हैड ऑलरेडी रिटायर इन 1958 सो आई 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 डिट हैव एनी कॉन्ट्रैक्ट विथ हिम बट आई वाज टोल्ड दैट व्हेन ही वाज द प्रिंसिपल देयर आर वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट आर्टिस्ट ऑफ द जनरेशन ऑफ माय पर्टिकुलर जनरेशन लाइक दास गुप्ता रोजर दास गुप्ता सन देन परितोष सन एंड देन सो सुशील कुमार मुखर्जी दे वर ऑल स्टूडेंट of chaudhry they were all in chennai so i feel that there is some connection between chennai and bengal you know and uh, so that 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 also happened in uh, because of panikar panikar himself was uh, influenced sir an extent by john mayroy you know he would appreciate john mayroy's works anyway for me joining an art school there was a it was like heaven going to hell here The science subjects going there, so I like a heaven. So I was I used to work almost ten to twelve hours in the classroom, and I was allowed by Panikkar to even work late nights and early mornings. So I would spend my time mostly in the college. And uh, the the uh, the thing is that I was surrounded only by by, by the students of art, you know. So Kerala, Karnataka, Tamil Nadu, some people from Andhra. And some people from from Ahmedabad, so people were all there, and it was a very interesting sort of a combination of all these people, and uh, talking about art, discussing about art every day. That was something which was uh, really important, which happened in my life. And uh, so that is then uh, the the atmosphere in the college was extremely good, and uh, we were uh, never questioned by uh, either the principal or the class teachers. as to why you are not staying in the classroom all the time because panikar himself told to some people that my best of my students are always in the canteen you know but when i want them to produce enough good works they produce so many it's so difficult for me to even select so that was a sort of a teaching we had in the college yeah. very unconventional teaching method very unconventional teaching method and yet he had instructed all the teachers that they should be working in the class that is not teaching by show you know by by showing how to uh, technique brush strokes and things like that they would be working they would be working painting and drawing and whatever it is and you would learn from that and then you were allowed to walk to any section you know even the first year students would go to six years class six year uh, class and then see the senior students how they were working so that's that was education for us I mean, really, I mean, Madras uh, School of Arts either produced good artists or bad artists. They didn't produce mediocre artists. Uh, the Madras School is is known for its adherence or its um, uh, preoccupation with the line, with line drawing, and and I think that is very evident in your work right through because the strokes. are very important for you i mean even in abstraction even in paintings which are um, you know virtually abstractions whether it's of uh, the tree or uh, you know human scapes or whatever even when they are sort of abstracted um, as the subject matter is abstracted you still see the line you know it's inescapable in your work is that an offshoot of your training in the madras uh, it is school. it is because the uh, madras school really considered drawing as very important thing and uh, we six years of diploma every morning three hours 9 to 12 we have to draw modern drawing still life drawing still life painting modern pa painting still that and so one had to learn and then our teachers were also excellent in drawing all the other teachers Madras School of Arts uh, had, including Panikkar. Panikkar himself would, uh, if he had some time in the office room, I would have seen him doing. You know, uh, he would throw a bunch of keys on the table, and then he would start drawing, as if you know he was learning those things at that time. At, I mean, he was so senior an artist. But that was the sort of a you know uh, thing we had. We we learned from these teachers, and uh, so drawing is the biggest strength of the uh, Madras Art School. And uh, some of the some of them are uh, excellent, particularly I don't know that you have heard of Adi Mona. Adi Mona was my classmate, and he was a fantastic. Uh, you know, his, his skill for drawing is something unimaginable. He was influenced by Ganesh for certain things. 
some time. But otherwise, no, his works were very good. And then each one developed their own drawing. They were not, they were not, you see, one thing is that nobody was uh, trying to uh, imitate the teacher's work. They, they started from the day one, they were artists, and then they had to, they had to evolve themselves, you know, themselves. And uh, it's it's open thing, you know, for, uh, for us. And uh, so that's how we want to learn from various teachers and uh, various senior artists. And uh, that was a very important thing which happened. There. And were you able to question the teachers' methods? Uh, yeah. uh, I mean, did they encourage? Um... Yeah. You see, teachers, when they were working, that was a pleasure to watch them. Whether they did the portrait painting in the classroom or, uh, or compositions, it was uh, something of the, their techniques and the way they adopted the way uh, the canvas work and things. So that was a very important thing for us to observe and observe the senior students how they were doing. You know, when I joined the college, uh, I I saw some of the senior students. They were what I call modern art at that time, and I said, "My God, I have come here to learn this art, or rather, I am learning uh, you know skilled." Uh, work in portrait painting and drawing and things like that. It, it, I, it, you know, it, it took some time for me to realize how difficult it is to evolve something and what's called modern art. It's not that easy. And so uh, the atmosphere was like that. You know, and, uh, we could uh, walk to any section and there was no restriction whatsoever. It was like, it was like a heaven and it's like, like repeat it again. Probably a teaching method that um, other institutions today would do well to emulate. Yeah, in fact, in fact, when I ask it in the institutions, all the institutions, they say we are here to teach. We are not here to paint in the classroom. We are here to teach. What is teaching? Really speaking, what is teaching? Teaching is something we have to be doing, and then uh, others are getting inspired by it. You know, I don't have to follow that brush has to be held like this. It can be held this way, that way, but as long as I can produce something with that, it's fine. You know? So that that's how the teaching was in Madras Art School. Yeah. What about uh, other uh, sort of uh, important uh, art forebears who um, you didn't necessarily get influenced, maybe that's a wrong word to use, but who provided inputs into the development of your artistic style? You know. Like you mentioned Souza, for instance, and you also admire the work of other artists. Yeah. See, I, uh, when I was uh, in the fourth year, I think 60, 1964, 63, 64, I came across Souza's paintings in the book. I really liked it so much. I really admired his work so much. And um, uh, even I did a painting which is very much like Souza's, and even <laughs> Signature also, you know, the way he could do everything like that, I was doing. And uh, then it so happened that 1964, I got National Scholarship for painting. And um, the next year, the extension of uh, scholarship, I had to go to Bombay. And um, I, it was accidental that Suza's exhibition was taking place there, in Bombay, at Jangra Gallery. And I went there and I was so happy to meet Suza there, you know and uh, show him my works and so he was he was very very nice person excellent uh, uh, he could write so well poetry and he was working for at, at, i think a studio international magazine used to publish his works there and uh, so i was very fascinated by his writings and his art and everything but that that was for about two two and a half years after that it just started going out well, I think I think inspiration, influence can happen. When it happens, I think you should keep it open and get it get influenced. By then, digest it and go further because we can't be doing the same thing, no. So that's one one of the reasons why I then you know there are so many other artists, like Jay Swaminathan and K.J. Subramanian and people like that. Their works were also very interesting for me, and Swaminathan particularly was there. You know, the way he was doing his uh, uh, mountains and the bird and things like that, very beautiful uh, technique. And, and he, was, he, was, he was also thinking of something very Indian, you know, in his works. Yeah. 
and Subramaniam sir also, earlier of his, his works were more Western, but later on the works of his is, you know, he, uh, some sort of a folk influence and uh, he would play with the colors and forms so well. It was a very interesting thing to watch him doing. Yeah. In fact, when I had interviewed uh, K.G. Subramanian, he mentioned that he used to uh, live, I think, in Tarasheri or somewhere in, K in one of the uh, towns, in small towns in Kerala. And uh, he used to visit some of these little temples there and look at the murals and the carvings. And that actually influenced him later. Yeah. And the folk art forms, yeah. like the dance forms, the folk dance forms yeah. and so on. So and also his technique and also the, the, the method he would, and amazing that person who was in his 80s, I mean I went to Baroda and my friend Jay Kumar took me to his place also and I, but later on also I went and saw his, what number of paintings, all over paintings, you know, at the age of 90 he was producing morning to night paintings, fantastic painter. And a very good thinker also. That's a very important thing. A combination of that. That's that's one thing I found uh, in Padika. A very thinking artist. And uh, he could analyze everything, talk about it, though we didn't have art history department in our college, unfortunately. In Madras College of Arts, we didn't have art history department. So but but people like Padika could explain to us many things. And then we, and there were very good uh, books in the library, which one could go there and study them. And one went to British Council or American Center to see those art books there. And so we all, some of us were interested in learning, we, we learned ourselves. And um, so we never felt the absence of artistry department in the college. But generally I feel uh, Madras College of Art um, lacks, uh, you know, the students of Madras College has a problem because of the absence of art history department there. Yeah. So, I mean, this was one of the subjects that was discussed during the yes, yes. panel discussion, but it's, um, it's a difficult thing now when you don't have archives and you don't have yeah. any kind of records yeah. of what was done. So, uh, how do you think this can be overcome? This I hope so. I think they should. Um, it's, it's, every institution should have art history department. Not only that, they should also have. Uh, they should also show the students, uh, you know, um, uh, everything: how to prepare canvas, and uh, how to repair your paintings, and how to write about your paintings, how to talk about your painting. Everything has to be taught. Mm -hmm. It's it's not just the painting and drawing alone. Okay? These are all important subjects people should know in the college itself. It will help them a lot. And from there to Cholamandal Arts Village, which was which was quite a unique experiment, wasn't it? Like a commune for artists, yeah. where you had all the freedom in the world to do exactly what you wanted. See, how, how did that pan out and how did that uh, shape your destiny as an artist? Yeah. You know, what happened was, uh, Madras College of Art had very strong craft section. It was a school of arts and crafts. It was actually crafts department, craft section till uh, Havel who was the principal first and then Chaudhary took over. Till that time it was only crafts there. And then painting and drawing and sculpture came later. But then this craft section was a fantastic craft section. They had a crafts of uh, you know, batik and ceramic and enamel work, wood work, tap, you know, all these sort of things were there. And uh, so, not only we, uh, we were allowed to go and uh, see the students and the other students' works in the uh, classrooms, we were also allowed to go and work with this in the, in the craft section. So, I could walk into the ceramic department and do something there. I could walk in the enamel section there, Bhati, like that. So, it was a very strong, uh, you know, the influence of the craft on the Madras art, art students was very strong there. At the same time, it so happened that, um, uh, you know, uh, Panikar called some of us, about 20 of us, and asked, what, what were you going to do after finishing your diploma? Then uh, we said, we will take up some jobs. He said, no, best of my students have all 
gone out of the thing and they they are not if they you know, today they don't even exist you know doing some good painting and good so that's not a very good thing to happen so i better better uh, you find some other solution and uh, why don't people try to extend your art to craft and see the possibilities so the nearest thing which we could think of was uh, batik because batik is something very close to painting also no so we learned batik and did batik nearly for 2 years and uh, produced wall hangings sarees dress materials and all these things some of them were there they exhibition yes, yeah. and uh, then then uh, we had an exhibition and uh, it was almost a sell out we were quite surprised ourselves to see that uh, that our things were selling like that that gave us idea that we should have a place of our own and done it to work then um, it's not only to work but also we thought we should have a place to live around and um, so what we formed we formed a cooperative we call it artists handicrafts association and um, cooperative bought nearly 10 acres of land in stages and uh, we called it cholamandal artist village cholamandal was not it was not started for art promotion it was only for making giving so when it, it opened the gates there were good artists mediocre artists all of them came and so it has got it has got its strength and weaknesses both but at the same time it had really helped a lot of artists lot of artists and uh, uh panikar himself was uh, 1966 he started the village and uh, 1967 i remember he was uh, a, he was giving an interview to some newspaper mag- magazine magazine or newspaper and then the, the reporter was asking him now that uh, you have uh, 25 artists have joined uh, this place he meant they could achieve everything for themselves in 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 the, in the field of art he said no it's an experiment even if it can help six artists more than that is i mean we would have achieved more than that and i'm sure it has more than six artists have done something for themselves there and also they asked him that this man asked him so how long do you think this generate this artist village would last he said one generation i can't find anything after this generation their children may not be interested in art at all how do you know that how i will i know so one generation if it survives it's fine it's an experiment we have done it and see what it have what happens nandagopal is still there nandagopal unfortunately died last year oh yeah he died last year he had a heart attack and he died panikar son yeah yeah, yeah. and uh, anyway there are there are uh, some artists who are still there of my my generation and uh, some artists have uh, gone out from my number in london some of them are in paris some of them are in united states and some of them are in kerala mm-hmm. so i think you know as uh, uh, the demand you know they they, they had to sort of leave for their own different destinations like me i i was there in 1988 and i moved to bangalore in 1988 but i do I still keep uh, cholamandal connection very much in, intact but one of the interesting aspects of the cholamandal experiment which uh, you know what you just mentioned about uh, panikar's uh, sort of uh, exhorting you to you know start uh, <coughs> you know practicing craft mm. this is quite a reversal of uh, you know the way artists generally think because even kg subramanian has mentioned that's a big hiatus between art and craft and artists tend to look down i mean there is a tendency to look down on craft as something that is mechanical or something that doesn't require imagination and creativity so this was quite a reversal of that in the sense that he encouraged you to actually put yourself in the shoes of a crafts person yeah. and how did that because i am noticing that you have been collaborating with crafts people you have been collaborating with weavers with uh, copper uh, smiths and there are a few other artists who are also doing the same and this in a way is i mean it has enriched your um, artistic um, as in that your output see we uh, we used to have this discussion about art and craft um, really speaking 
to the very thin line which divides art and craft. And uh, question, question yourself, who are the people who built Mahabalipuram? Do you call them artists or craftsmen? Who built Hampi? Very difficult to say. The art and craft division was very much a Western thing. They make it very clear. This is craft and this is art. But it is just to use. Yeah, uh, but then mm. the thing is that crafts were not given that importance there. And uh, they called it crafts. It's like, you know, craftsman is turning out something. And, but for, for me, it is a sort of a, it's an integral part of oneself. It's very difficult to divide this, you know. Though, though and, and it, I, think, I think it has helped me a lot to, to learn various crafts and reacting to, reacting with the craftsmen. And my art also has progressed in that direction. It's not, uh, you know, I'm not looking only towards the West for my work. I'm looking towards uh, the people which are, who are doing something here locally. And, um, and uh, you know, in fact, we had a discussion at one point of time in the 60s, in the 60s. Um, are we going to follow the West continuously or are we going to find some other Indian, quote unquote, Indianness, you know, or contemporary Indianness? painting. Now, look at the artists, most of the artists of from 30s, 40s and 50s, Indian artists. Most of them were influenced by the West, you know, most of them. And, um, and then our art schools are also uh, very Western, you know, they're, they're teaching method is all Western. And so we have to really question ourselves as to how, how we can bring in the Indianness, you know, if at all is something like that in our work. And uh, so some of us, we really tried hard to do it. And then I, I, I thought the best thing would be to, to not to see for some time reproductions of Picasso, Brock, Modigliani, nothing, you know. Not to see them at all. And not to see their, the films which is made on them. And uh, instead of that, see more of Tanjore paintings, Mysore school paintings, Bastar village sculptures, like that. And uh, that made a difference. Your thinking started changing, you know. It's not, uh, otherwise, you know, every day morning, if you see Picasso, you'll be Picasso. You'll, you'll think of only Picasso. So you can't think of uh, your Angoli, for that matter, you know, column, what we draw. It's a fantastic line. Why should you think of Paul Clay there? You can think of our own uh, people, you know, what they have, what they have achieved. So that really helped me a lot. And also, I look towards um, uh, folk element in, in Karnataka folk singing. So I hear the loose, all these sort of things. And my interest in literature helped me a lot to, to understand these things better. And uh, so that my art also sort of slowly moved from that direction of the Western thing completely to more Indian. Uh, of course, the technique, what I adopt is still Western. It's a canvas painting using uh, oil colors and brushes and everything is all Western. But something else one could achieve in, you know, because of uh, uh, one's uh, different way of thinking at that time which happened in the 60s. And you're also mentioning Chagall who has, you know, his stained glass yeah. works and yeah. so on, how you met him and... Uh, I, I didn't meet him, but you know, I went in 1981 to Paris to learn the technique of stained glass. Uh, I was interested in stained glass and the French government gave me scholarship to go there. And uh, then uh, I was taken to a studio 100 kilometers away from uh, Paris to uh, a, a stained glass worker, uh, his studio. And then where, where I saw Chagall had made a painting and about on, on like a mat, you know, about 10 feet by 6 feet size painting. And this man, uh, was working out uh, the, the, the way it was, you know, cutting into shapes and things like that, the whole area and getting colors organized, color classes and everything organized. So I asked him, you know, how do, how do you both do it? So he said, uh, Shakal comes and leaves the painting and I do all these things temporarily. Then I fix it against the light and he comes and stays with me for two, three days. 
and then uh, that's it and he corrects whatever it has been done and I finished the whole thing. So I said, how do you know Shagar so well? He said, I worked for 40 years with him. Almost all the stained glass works, internationally known works of Shagar, stained glass, are all done by this man. So I felt, I was thinking at that time, my God, only if we can collaborate with some people. And uh, so I, I was open for collaboration, and that's how it happened later on. So it has to come from a place of mutual respect and... It has to, it has to, you have to have mutual respect. And uh, in fact, uh, people were asking me, uh, when I was working with uh, Subrairu, the viewer, and uh, the first exhibition which I had about 16, 17 works way back, it's a few years ago. And uh, people asked me, where is the, uh, you know, how can you work with a craftsman, you know? And uh, where, where do you stand and where, where does he stand? I said, very equals there. Very, very equals. Without me, he can't do. Without him, I can't do. What's the problem then? But ego is a is important thing for a for an artist. Without ego, you can, cannot create, create also. But at the same time, when you are collaborating, that ego should not be there. We should we should be really prepared for accepting complete reality, respecting and I respect Shea Subairu as an artist, not as a craftsman. That's why the reasons why whenever I have my exhibitions either here or Chennai, I invite him, I take him there so that he can meet people, he can talk about his work. And I, I don't like uh, to say that I have done all these things. It is we have done it. Always we have done it, not I have done it. So I always feel that when it comes to craft, I mean uh, the, the collaborated works, it's always we have, we have done it. You had such a multifaceted uh, kind of um, outlook on art in the sense you've imbibed um, inspiration from music, you have uh, sort of uh, partaken of, uh, um, you know, you've done covers for uh, Ramanujan's uh, poetry and also for Bendre's uh, work and you have uh, been inspired by Girish Karnad's uh, uh, plays and you know theater activity and collaborated in that too and I mean in addition to all that you've also been an art director for two films I mean what is it that it's almost like uh, you know a renaissance personality so how do you achieve all this and what is it that impels you to do so many uh, sort of cut across uh, so many different disciplines yeah. well, it was a completely coincidence in my life that I I was interested in uh, poetry, Kannada poetry, even when I was studying in the college here. But, uh, but, but it was, um, uh, then I went to Chennai, and uh, music, Chennai, you know, you can you get fantastic Carnatic music there. You know, you can, you can get everybody there, possible, genius, uh, you know, the Chennai uh, musicians. Then, uh, when I was there, and I also, I see, earlier, in, in when I was in Bangalore, my um, I used to only listen to mostly Carnatic music. And 1957, when Mysore became Karnataka, that time first time ever on uh, on uh, holiday radio, we had we would, we would uh, hear Gibson Joshi, Kamuga Hanugal, and you know Hindustani music first time ever. So it was it was too uh, you know far for me, you know, to appreciate. But it took some time for me to realize that it's very important for me to keep myself open. And then I went to listen to Bismillah Khan's Chennai in Chennai. That changed my, my mind and uh, my, my interest in Hindustani music. The Nokarnatta I wrote later and Tikhtokarnatta Thakur and uh, people like that. Then the other thing which happened was 1963, uh, Girish Karnat moved from uh, Oxford to Chennai and he was the assistant manager of Oxford University Press there in Chennai. And I was introduced to him by one of our common friends, a writer and a journalist by Krishna Murthy. He is no more uh, now. But he introduced me to Girish Karnat, me to Girish Karnat. Then both of us we met first time. Then we became good friends. One thing is that we could speak Kannada. He was interested in art, I was interested in literature. 
So he exposed me to the best of literature. That was a time when the uh, Navya movement was taking place in Canada also, Canada literature. And so it, he, he really gave me best of uh, Canada books to read. And also um, he explained uh, uh, Kanu, Sartre, Kafka, their things about you know, uh, existentialism and things like that. So I was, uh, I was very fascinated to know all these things. Then it so happened in 1967, 68, and, uh, in Dharwar, they asked me to have a show. Normally, nobody goes to Dharwar to have a show, usually. But then, uh, then one of Irish Karnat's friends asked me to show there, and I went with Irish Karnat too. There, I met some of these writers. I know there is a Manohar Kranthamala public agency, public, uh, public publishing house, and which are publishing all these Kanavya, uh, you know, Movement uh, literature. And uh, there they had a, you know, on a ladder, a ladder they had to go up and an adda, you know, sort of adda. There all these writers, important writers, Rajiv Tarana, Chandrasekhar Kamba, and all these people were sitting there and talking. And so I was very fascinated by seeing all these things going on. And uh, it so happened that the, 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 the publisher himself, he asked me, uh, Vasudev, why don't you do cover designs for all our books now? I said, I can do, but I need, I need to know what they have written. So you sent me the manuscripts, and that's how I started doing, reading them and then doing cover designs for that. And I, then I met another uh, very important literary critic uh, in Tarawa, who was a, uh, called Kirithanath Kurtukoti. He was a critic for Bendres poetry, dear Bendres poetry. And he explained to me Bendres poetry in, in detail. And uh, I also met Bindra, he came to my exhibition and it was a very thrilling experience for me to see a person like Bindra coming to an exhibition and, and you know it was a very, uh, he made some small remark which I will tell you now. He said, Nodri, why do you give a title? Shishkaya Kurtiranu. And I that, sir, if I don't give it, people will ask, how do I see the painting? So I have to give some title. And I no, 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 don't give title. I want to see the painting the way I want to see. I want to enjoy the painting the way I want to enjoy. Why do you put this thing? No. Then you know, I thought it's a very, very good thing that that person like him to tell me that. Anyway, uh, so coming back from there in 1968, I read a lot of paintings, and uh, Kalpavriksha was one of the poems which I was in my in the poetry poem influenced me, inspired me, and I did a series of paintings and. Uh, one or two paintings are also there in the exhibition of 1967-68 series. And um, so literature, music, art combined. And 65-66, Raman, Ramanujan came to Chennai. And he used to be in Chicago and he used to come and stay in, for two, three months in Chennai to learn Tamil, you know, to, to translate from Tamil, Sangam poetry to English. He wanted to learn Tamil. And so he came to Chennai and then used to stay there. And again, Girish introduced me to him. And uh, now we became good friends. And Ramanujan asked me to do a cover design for the first collection of Kannada poems called Hokkodali Hu Villa, uh, No Flower in the Navel. So I did that cover design. And uh, he was very appreciative of that. And then he used to come from exhibitions and meet regularly. Whenever he came to Chennai, we used to meet them, meet him. And uh, so the thing, the thing is then, in 1967, this uh, uh, publisher in Dharwa, uh, he sent manuscript of uh, Samskara, which Anathimurthy had written, and he had sent it to him for publication. And then Girish got it, and then he read it and gave it to me. And uh, the moment I read it, I thought it's a fantastic thing for a film. I told Girish, we have to make a film myself. Said, yes, I also thought about it, I think about it, but we should uh, do something. So for nearly a year or two, uh, we, both of us were not filmmakers, so we didn't know anything about filmmaking. And so we would go and sit and watch very good films now and then, you know, and uh, see how it's all done, script writing, you know, how it should be, thing, things like that, you know. And uh, for me, uh, Anant Murthy's uh, Samskara, I, I, I could relate a lot because of uh, uh, background, <laughs> a similar background. You see, the thing is, when he says that uh, cockroach in uh, uh, buttermilk, 
I can understand that because I can see the buttermilk in the cockroach, the cockroach in the buttermilk. And uh, so, uh, so I, uh, that, that sort of a thing really helped me too. Only thing was that I had to literally change the you know, method of thinking because I was going from my realistic or uh, impressionistic painting to a little bit of abstraction. But film, I come back to realism. So I took uh, Sajetri's uh, Patar Panchali's example and uh, no, I thought I should do better than that. Anyway, so it took some time for, uh, for us to do it, the film. And then well, and you were still in your 20s then. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, so it was very, very interesting, uh, you know, and to, uh, to work with a group of people, you know, amateur theater actors, and uh, then we very funnily, you not know, for the coincidence again, uh, the Australian cameraman, Tom Cowan, he had uh, come to Cholamanda to uh, visit Cholamanda for a few days. And uh, then when he came home one evening, then talking to him about this film, he was very excited. He said, Mr. Vasudev, do you think I can do anything for this film? I said, look, I, we don't know what you have done. You know, and so he got his uh, documentaries from Australia. And then we all saw it and then we said he could be a good uh, cameraman for us. And he did an excellent job in, uh, in Samskara. And uh, of course, I think, really speaking, it was he who knew cinema, who, who really had done work in film. And there was another assistant director called Sagitam Srinivas Rao. He was also, he also knew. Otherwise, all others were complete yes. amateurs. We didn't know anything about it. And then finally, the film was made. And uh, it, it, it was uh, banned by, by, not banned, uh, certificate was not given by the censor board. And uh, then I think intellectuals in Delhi and other places uh, you know, protested against that. And then uh, it was it got uh, released and it won the national award. That's how Samskara was made. It was made with just just by a bunch of people with enthusiasm. Yeah. And I, I really liked working that way. But I, I, I didn't continue to do art direction after that, except in Bamsho Riksha, where Karnad and Karan, both of both my good friends, directed the film and so I joined them. But later on I said no. I, it, it takes away a lot of one's time and uh, I needed to go back to my painting. So what I did was, uh, I told them anything outside the thing like uh, title cards for the film or publicity material, I will provide, I will do it, and, uh, but not doing art direction. So I, I stopped doing the art direction. Yeah. yeah, but um, you know, I mean it's interesting that while you were in your 20s itself, you were attracted by a theme uh, such as samskara, which was, uh, you know, a very, very iconoclastic, uh, it was a very iconoclastic theme because um, it was uh, challenging the status quo of that time, the caste system and so on. And also the position of women in a way, it, I mean, there is an underlying uh, feminist narrative there, yeah. which was not fully explored perhaps, but it was there. In fact, the other day in, in the film was screen for the discussion and somebody said, if somebody sees the whole thing through Chandri's point That's of view, you yes. ask it, you only said, okay, Chandri's point of view. It's a fantastic thing huh, to think of that. Yeah, yeah but um, I mean, now that you're talking of women and feminism, what role did the women in your life play in shaping your artistic sensibility or, you know, in the way, your trajectory of your work? I personally like women. And I, I really Start respect with your mother. I respect <laughs> My mother was a very strong woman, and uh, my late wife, Arma, was a painter. She was also a very strong woman. My present wife was also a very strong woman. <laughs> and I really enjoy being in the company of all these people. And uh, I think I think it's a question of respecting each other. That's very important for me. It's not that I am bigger than that or something like that. No, that's not the short. I I somehow feel that we should and. Um, Sometimes my, I, I think of this, you know, um, my mother would say, I told your father to do this, and, but he didn't do it, he could have done it. So I think of it now. Yes. Only thing is, if my father had listened to her, <laughs> perhaps it would have been a better thing. 
perhaps. You know, I don't know. I mean, this is what I feel. And um, in, in case of Arunimas also, and I when it, she was not only just a friend of mine, she became a, uh, my wife, and then she was, was an art critic for me, all combined. And so she would just reject, you know, this is a bad painting, what you have and done. And you would take it. I would take it. <laughs> I mean, I, this is a, no, I think, I think it's very important to respect others' opinion. And it's a, and a opinion and also respect each other. That's very important in life. And Amu comes from a very different... Uh, yeah, she comes from that... Uh, what, 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 happened, uh, what happened to me after meeting her and uh, to marrying her, I, I met quite a few people who, who were completely different from the art world, uh, like film, film activists in film, filmmakers, activist journalists, you know, activist writers, environmentalists. So the, the whole thing is a different thing altogether. And so it's, you know, it, it, it's also a part of, I think it, in a way, in, it influences you directly. You know? And, um, and like I a subconscious think, kind of uh, yeah, intervention. Yeah, it does, yeah. it does, yeah. And uh, that brings me to my next um, sort of uh, question about art being a catalyst for change. I mean, you have taken some bold stances. I mean, Samskara being one of them early on. And then uh, you also took a stance when Hussein was, um, yeah. uh, you know, um, practically evicted from yeah. <laughs> India yeah. because of the bigotry that prevailed. And um, how did, uh, I mean, you did react to that when very few artists had the gumption to do so. Or perhaps there were, I mean, I wouldn't say gumption, perhaps it didn't cross their minds that uh, yeah, you know, they yeah, needed I, to do that. Yeah, I, I think, you know, uh, uh, artist, um, I don't think any other artists in the country who has done more on Mahabharata Ramayana than Hussein. Really speaking, I admire him for that. But some people see something wrong, and they they decide. And poor man, you know, he was threatened. But they said that we're going to cut off your hand, cut off his head, and things like that. So poor chap, you have to go abroad and live there. And this is the land of Kajurabo. Yeah. <laughs> Kajurabo, and the land. And if, you see, if you see, if you see, um, uh, third-rate films it's produced all sex and violence and everything. I mean, well, it's all around. And in, in fact, it so happened that um, uh, once uh, we had a get together at the farm house of ours, and uh, then some people came and they said that, that they, were, they were late because there was a meeting going on in their club. They said, what's the meeting about? about? We were discussing about Hussein. They said, what did we discuss? Uh, what, what I think has happened is correct, you know, you should go out of the country. I said, look, if I did that painting, what do you would do? No, in your case, it's different. I said, how is it different? Just because I'm a Hindu? Just because he's a Muslim? That is not correct. You know, that's not the way to look at it. Art, artist is an artist, and you know, he can, and moreover, I think uh, uh, his, uh, whatever they, uh, they were talking about, the, the, mm, the image. Mm. It, is, it, is, it is not that, see, Hussein is one person who is not sensuous. His paintings are not, if you if you cross a breast, you just put yeah. in circles like that. But it's not the thing. It's, he's not sensuous painter. But they found something different in Hussein because they wanted to uh, 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 really attack him. But, you know, after he died also, we had a condolence meeting here, the National Gallery of Modern Art, Bangalore, but it didn't happen in Delhi. Delhi director of NGMA did not have the condolence meeting because he wanted to get a permission from the government of India. Whereas here, we didn't bother about it, we had it. Now because I, I think it's a respect for a person who did so much for Indian art. Yeah. Absolutely, he was yeah. a pioneer. Yeah, a pioneer. I also wanted to touch, we have very little time now, but I just wanted to touch on uh, your affinity towards nature which manifests itself in uh, Riksha, the tree of life, tree of life and uh, death. And um, in fact, throughout your paintings, there is 
you know, the intervention of nature or your outlook on nature is very evident. I mean, you know, it's your canvases and your tapestries and your uh, copper work. It's all imbued with uh, images from nature, whether it's birds or animals or, um, you know, uh, trees. So, I mean, what is it? I mean, has it always been an important concern for you? And are you also concerned about uh, our neglect of nature, so to speak, the environmental degradation that's now yeah. coming to pass? Yeah. Earlier, you know, uh, from, from my um, you know, classroom paintings, I went into slightly abstraction, and then uh, I went to like Kachara Ho, Panarak, and then I did a series of paintings on Maithuna, what I called it, uh, Maithuna, the act of love. And uh, later on, I realized that the act of love is not only between man and woman, it can be between various forms in nature. Sun, creative moon, stars. Yes, creative you know, force. Things, yeah. And then, uh, it was 1975, I went to Delhi with an exhibition, and uh, my paintings at that time, so I took, you know, the tree is just somewhere in the painting, took a center stage. I never realized why it took a center stage, I just did it. Then uh, one of my friends who came and saw the exhibition in Delhi, he said, is it Tree of Life? I had not heard about Tree of Life. Then I went and bought myself a book on Tree of Life and read, and then it meant a lot for so many religions, for craftsmen, for artists, others. And uh, I, I found it was a very exciting book uh, with a lot of reproductions. And then I realized how I was close to that. My, my thinking and my doing the paintings, without knowing the Tree of Life, I was going towards that. Then I read the philosophy of Tree of Life, more Indian, the way we see Kalpa Viksha, all this sort of thing, you know. So I read all those things and I felt one, one advantage uh, with that particular theme is from symbolism to abstraction, you could do, you know, and what one thing. And I spent on doing it. And sizes also, verticals, horizontals, for any shape you could do. And that also helped me a lot. Technically, also, it helped me a lot. I don't know whether the, how. I was, uh, I'm not a, I'm not a, uh, what can I say, uh, though my father was a agriculturist, he was more towards, uh, but I am not the kind who, uh, you know, who get inspired only in nature. I, I get inspired by many other things. And uh, so this, um, uh, uh, the, the tree which came into my painting, it's, it's more philosophical and uh, then it, it took its own shape and then Tree of Life and Death came sometime in middle of uh, 80s and uh, it's very uh, strange that uh, uh, after Arnava's passed away, uh, my, my, my late wife in, uh, she, in Girish Karnad made a short film on her, a documentary, in which he says that uh, one couldn't see anything in uh, destruction or whatever it is in Arnaz's work, whereas you can see in Vasudev's work, you know, you know, destruction things. We showed the painting also. So I just wondered whether, you no, know, I didn't, I didn't occur to me at that time, but perhaps, you know, it, it was uh, like that. And then I, I felt that, you know, the sort of, a, even when I, when I read about a tree, you know, tree doesn't, you know, it, it starts again coming up and it, it dies again coming up like that, you know. When in, in India we have this sort of a thing in philosophy, they say, like that, you know. So, I mean, the, the sort of a vague ideas, you know, about uh, things. And um, then when I came to Bangalore in 1989, and thanks to Amu, I met the environmentalists and others. Then I was thinking one day, I was just listening to music of someone, what what was uh, uh, soundscapes series music soundscapes you know I was listening to that and then um, suddenly this uh, started emerging environmental attitude I mean uh, the, the tree which is uh, you know cutting off the trees and uh, uh, destruction and things like that so I started painting all those things that was the you know. then that led to uh, theater of life and uh, because. Uh, 
At that time, I didn't have any place in the city to live, and so I, I was uh, using my uh, farm studio. Then my father, father gave me some agricultural land, so I built a farm in their house where I was uh, working most of the time. Then I used to see these villagers there in the, in the farm, sticking to the idiot box TV. And afternoons they would sit, and then that's all. Anything is anything happening there, they would accept it. And uh, then I did a series of heads watching the TV and things like that. Then theater of life started the the series. And in fact, uh, Amu only coined the title for me, theater of life. I never coined that title. So then, uh, uh, then I realized that uh, you know we are also like that. You see, when you are seeing a film, we want to be Amitabh Bachchan, we want to be Dilip Kumar, we want to be so and so. And uh, you know, the changing of the dress also. They, I can understand why they change three or four times in three minutes uh, a dance scene or a you know, music scene. Because they want to attract people to, to that. And uh, then I also felt that even the readers, you know, the television readers, they also have background, it goes on different VCC, CM, everything. But uh, you know, they're all in the same expression, most of them are. And um, then what really is, um, is very difficult to know a person without everybody wearing masks. It is very difficult to know a person without feeling those masks. You know? So this theater of life had all these things. Plus, Ramanujan's stories, what he had told me, my grandfather's stories, and also uh, because I had worked for uh, Vivekananda and Karnad's place, so all sort of things started coming into this uh, theater of life series. Yeah. Okay, on that note, I realize that we have really encroached on the uh, audience's time to, you know, ask their questions. So perhaps I have many more, but I shall hold my tongue. And if anybody has any questions for Vasudev, please go ahead now. Please identify yourself. Quite <laughs> digesting what you just said, I guess. Well, if uh, nobody has any questions, I have one more. Yes. Um, that is about art institutions in the country. Yes. Um, you know, you yourself played a role in terms of uh, you know um, pushing um, the government to set up. Bangalore University now has an art faculty, which it didn't have uh, several years ago, right? And uh, you have also set up spaces for um, our, you know, the viewing public to interface with artists such as, um, I mean, you know, the art park, for instance. And uh, you've also set up, you know, charities, Arnava's Vasudev charities for helping struggling artists when they are younger and don't have the wherewithal to pursue their uh, vocation. So if you can talk a little bit about your vision and uh, how to stem the apathy that seems to be permeating some of the institutions. See, when um, it started with uh, Arnava's charities first, and uh, after she passed away, some of my friends said that uh, it is better to start a charity for art. Then I was thinking of giving some money for uh, cancer, a shade of cancer. But then they said this, so I thought about it, then we started this uh, Arnava's Charities. And uh, since 1989, uh, we are giving financial assistance to young artists. And uh, till today, nearly 180 artists have got financial assistance from this. And uh, one thing is that, you know, it, it, it's not a big money, but at that particular time, when you are a student and when you need money, if you get even 1,000 rupees a month or something like that, it, it helps you a lot. And uh, so that is, that is that's one thing which I have been doing. And um, then, uh, of course, I'm supported by the other uh, people like uh, uh, Girish Karad himself, so the trustee is there, and uh, Shanta Gohan, she is a good friend of our family. And then now I've taken uh, uh, an artist uh, in Chennai, Saile, she's also one of the trustees. And uh, my son Ram is one of the trustees. 
because in his father mother's name they, they started. But uh, that is going on. The other thing is in Bangalore, I felt um, the need to start something. Now when I when I went for a uh, some sort of a conference, there were about 200 uh, uh, schools principals were all invited, and uh, then. When I talked about art, they were asking me, you know, we don't have art in our schools, we don't have artists to teach there, or we don't have time for art there in our schools like that. So then I asked some of my artist friends, like Avikashi, Shantamani, and they, they said, uh, then we'll start something uh, for, for this. And one is art appreciation program, at the same time, giving, uh, uh, you know, to create uh, some kind of library and things like that. So then, I was a member of uh, one of the trustees of Ananya. Ananya is an organization which is doing uh, good work in the music and dance mm -hmm. in Bangalore. They've been doing very well. I'm one of the trustees there. And so the managing trustee uh, said that, uh, why do you want to start some other organization? Start under Ananya only. So we called it Ananya uh, Drishya. Drishya, usually. So we started about uh, 10 years ago. And uh, it so happened that we wanted to, to create a funds, you know, to start some funds. So we requested about 70 Bangalore artists based in Bangalore, based in Bangalore and we gave them two small canvases, each of them, and uh, said that you please give that uh, the paintings and whatever is sold will go to the, you know, to this uh, for creating funds. And I knew that it's very difficult to sell everything in an exhibition. So I requested some of my friends. Uh, in the industry days and you know, uh, people like that, and to 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 buy the paintings, and uh, I must say that today we are having sitting here one of my friends, Ravi Kavale, Ravi Kavale. He bought the entire you know, 140 works, and uh, it, I think he has filled his rooms in, in his house, and uh, then he gave money for that, and uh, so that is that is what that helped us a lot to carry on with the activity, and what we do is every month. We invite one artist to make a presentation and it's open to public and a uh, PowerPoint presentation and then it's a sort it's of art appreciation only. Then the moderator is there to discuss things and that's one part of it. The other part, then also we are encouraging the workshop for children. You know, anybody who is doing work, or doing good workshop, we try to support them financially. Then the other thing is a few years ago, about five years ago, uh, I felt the need that, uh, that people, people generally don't go to art galleries. We don't have the habit of going to art galleries. And uh, then, other thing is that they're afraid to meet the artists and talk to them. So we thought we should avoid, we should create some atmosphere for them to, you know, to, to, to come near the artists. So a few artists joined together and then we created art park. So every, first Sunday of every month, um, next to Ravindra Kalakshetra, it is Sculpture Garden. So about 25, 30 artists, they all assemble there, and uh, they do drawings, paintings, variety, they bring their, part of their works also from their houses. And it's uh, sold at a very, uh, very low price. Uh, not very low prices, but uh, compared to our galleries, it's much cheaper. And uh, then, in a way to, to help the people to see art and acquire art. And people can come there and uh, sit there and watch the artist, talk to him, and you know, talk to her. And so the, the thing is that is growing very well. And now, now what is happening is that a lot of people are asking from different areas of Bangalore, like Jayanagar, JP Nagar, HSR Layout, Dalanka, Whitefield. They're saying, why don't you people do it in our areas? Because the JC Road is normally, normally on Sunday, it's a, it's a you know, commercial business center. Whereas, uh, I think we are, we are planning uh, to do it at least third Sunday of every month, in the course of the next two, three months, we'll start that program. And it has really helped a lot to, for people to come and uh, know, acquire work and also react to the artists and see their work. Even, you know, if, if, if an artist is selling in the gallery for a much bigger price, there we tell the artist to price it a very, uh, you know, and then people can acquire those works. Yeah. And it creates an it, it art a, consciousness, aesthetic sensibility. And the University of Bangalore, you know, at uh, 
for me, I think uh, education is, you know, art education is important and university should also handle it. Only we had private colleges in Bangalore and we never had a university handling it. And so the then Vice Chancellor accepted to do it and uh, Dr. Timapa and uh, so we got uh, the, uh, you know, his, his uh, support. But and you were saying you were very persistent. <laughs> <laughs> I I have to go a number of times to him because otherwise it, nothing happens otherwise. You know, we have got to go. And uh, thanks to one uh, we have got here, I think Mr. Jay Kumar. Jay Kumar is here? Uh, Jay Kumar heads the institution now. Jay Kumar is a very well known painter, sculptor, and graphic artist who was teaching in Baroda. And uh, when we wanted to have somebody, you know, quote, unquote, Canada speaking. <laughs> Because after all, you know, that's very important the University of Bangalore, uh, you know, they want it. So we requested him and he came and joined and he's doing his excellent work there. They've got a beautiful building now. I think it's time people go there and visit that uh, institution. Yeah. And uh, the, for me, two uh, persons inspired me in my life. Two artists. One is Padikar himself. Because without him, I don't think could have created Cholamandal and you know, uh, life at a time. And uh, the other person is K.K. Hebar. Hebar was not my teacher directly, but Hebar was always inspired me because he was helpful to students. He was helpful to young artists. You know, he was always going, going out to reach, reach out to them. And uh, so that these two people have really inspired me. And I feel that one should always do something in society, you know, for society. It's always, you know, we, we, we can do our paintings in our studios, we can have our exhibition, we can sell and everything, but I think something else also should be done. You know, I feel that way. So I'm doing this. And I enjoy it. That's, that's Thank you so much. It's been so wonderful. Thank you.